Tonight's webinar is a webinar that we do for family and friends, for siblings uh, of Evoke clients. And, and for me, it's important because wilderness therapy for many people still today is a very unknown intervention, a very unknown process. And so it might be hard to explain it to your family and friends. And so we invite you to invite them onto this. You can share this link with them. You can ask questions that they've asked you. I'm happy to answer those. There's really no question is off limits. And, and because it's not in the public eye very much, I want to bring that as, as much as possible back to the public, back to your support system, back to the people in your life so that they can understand it. So I'm going to go first to some pre-listed questions that, that I often get. And then I'm going to I'm going to go to any live questions that, that have come in tonight. Please let me know how you're related to an Evoke client if you ask a question. And um, if you're under the age of 25, let me know your age. That's really helpful. Or if you're asking for a younger person, let me know the age because I, I want to be able to explain it in a way that's age appropriate. Probably one of the most typical questions that I receive is, what does a typical day look like? So Evoke Therapy Programs is a primitive living nomadic model. And what that means is we're not going out of camp cabins. We're not using a base camp. We're hiking the entire time from location to location with everything in, in the backpack of all the clients or students in a given group, given group. And we will operate on hundreds of thousands of acres of land, of, of national forest land and of Bureau of Land Management, federal land. And there are backup support that come out and drop off fresh fruit, um, vegetables, uh, fresh food twice a week, fresh laundry each week, fresh water. But really, we're hiking from place to place. There's no coming indoors during any of that process. And, and two days a week, we call layover days. Layover days are when the therapists go out and we're doing therapy. It's really hard to do a lot of talk therapy when we're hiking. So when the therapists are out there, they're having a session with all of the clients, they're running two groups with the clients, they're talking to the staff and developing the, the plan, the therapeutic plan for the week. So that, that's what goes on during layover days. On the other five days a week, they're hiking four or five of those days, ideally, depending upon group makeup, and their, their abilities, their location, and also the weather. And so on those days, they wake up in the morning, they have breakfast, they, they clean up camp, they pack up their packs, they start their hike to move to a new site. Throughout the day, they can stop for breaks, for, for of course, for lunchtime, mealtime. We want them to spend one hour a day doing personal work, personal work assigned to them that's part of their academic and therapeutic curriculum, but also that is customized by the therapists and by the group leaders. They can have groups, spontaneous groups throughout all the day, throughout the day. So an average group is going to have anywhere from a few to 10 groups a day that are short in duration. They'll often have a morning group that's very formal and an evening group that's very formal that's led by the staff, initiated by the staff. The therapist will often assign those. So they're having these groups, they're hiking, they're reading, they're writing, they're working on some schoolwork, they're having meals. We have what we call MFT or mandatory fun time every day. So we're trying to teach them games and to have fun. That's an important part of, of healing, of life, of balance. We arrive at camp in the evening. They split up and rotate the chores every day. They're getting camp set up. They're then setting up their own personal shelters, cooking dinner, eating, cleaning up dinner, and then a group, sometimes storytelling, music, and just casual hangout time at night. So that's the way that a typical day looks. And all of this becomes grist for the therapeutic mill, right? Anything can become therapy. Aside from physical safety, nothing really is a priority over therapy. So if somebody's struggling with making a, a fire by rubbing sticks together, which is an activity we do most every day, uh, if somebody is struggling because they got a difficult letter from mom and dad, or if there's conflict in the group, any of that can become therapy. So although the therapists are only there the, those two days a week, a lot of the significant work happens in between the therapy visits. Phone calls to families can happen. They're writing letters home throughout the week. Uh, families visit throughout the program in all of our groups. 
about to say, everything becomes therapeutic. And, and so primitive living, which means that they're not in cabins or using electricity, and nomadic, which means they're always hiking, they're not being transported anywhere. They're, they're kind of wandering around, if you will, in the wilderness. What if my child at home won't write? Then there's a question or two that's come up like this live from one of you this evening. It's really important, and I think a lot of the skills and tools that we teach in relationship to their child that is at Evoke, that you practice some of those with your children at home, right? These are applicable no matter whether your child's doing well or struggling. And so more important than getting them to write, my question would be, why don't they want to write? Remember, a lot of clients and students, young people, that get sent to evoke um, were creating a lot of conflict. You know, there was a lot of energy poured into them. Sometimes there was uh, bullying of siblings or, or a lack of kindness and empathy towards siblings. And so the child left at home, and sometimes, I don't, I don't want to overstate this, but might have experienced some small T trauma. Right? We talk about big T and small T trauma. And so sometimes they just need their own space, and we don't want to be intrusive to them. And so more than getting them to write, more than getting them to, to feel or move through, it, move through a certain process, I would pay attention to what they might be trying to tell you what they might be feeling. You get to have your boundaries as, as a parent, of course, but in this, this section, this context, it's really important to honor what they might need to express through their, their they're not writing, they're not talking about it, they're not engaging. I, I would spend more energy, more time and focus on that than I would at getting the, the objective or the goal of getting them to engage in, in a certain way. How do I help my child at home get over the hurt? That's the same kind of question. Don't try to help them get over it. Try to hear it, understand it, empathize with it. You know, I teach my staff all the time. Don't try to fix these kids. Try to see them and hear them, understand them. And then stand by in amazement when, when seeing them and hearing them and connecting them leads to dramatic healing and change. And so, yes, there are opportunities for, for growth, for teaching, for facilitating and encouraging change, but it has to be laid on the foundation of connection, of understanding. Very, very, very quickly, most people go to fixing it, to anecdotes, to lessons with a, with a, with a moral ending. Just talk, listen, connect, share, if you can, ideally, relate to them. Know that, again, they've experienced some trauma. I was talking to my group this week. Trauma, my best, my favorite de definition of trauma is anything less than optimal. And when we, when we set the bar there, we really open it up to, to just hear people's story instead of judging and telling them you know, other people have it worse or look on the bright side or think of it this way or that way. Before I move on to the next question, it reminds me of this, this quote that I saw one time that fits here, that made so much sense. I heard somebody say, telling somebody that they shouldn't feel bad because other people have it worse than them is no different than telling somebody they shouldn't be happy because other people have it better. Right? Everybody is entitled to their feeling. And that, that applies to the child that's at Evoke and it applies to the children at home, including children that we call parents, the ones that have gray hairs, wrinkles, receiving hair. My family is not supportive of my decision. How do I deal with their constant criticism of me sending my child to a vote? That's a really, really tough one. Um, and the child, um, the child at home, um, excuse me, the, the, the family at home may not understand. You know, they, they can often say things that, that they think comes from a place of love, like, you know, you just love your child, just have boundaries, like everybody's an expert, but they haven't lived. And, and for some it's challenging because the child at home, right, the, the child when they were home, the, before they got sent to evoke, 
may have been polite and agreeable to extended family members. So it won't make sense. But it, when people understand that this is a place of healing, that in fact, most of our clients and students and families say after the process, everybody should go to wilderness therapy. Everybody could benefit from it. My students, 80 or 90% of my students say that at some point and believe that, come back to work for us, right? Develop a love. That's the, the, the culture that I live in. And so it's not a punitive experience. It might seem dramatic. It's definitely challenging. But I do want to say to you, it's, it's in some ways the safest place that your child will ever be emotionally. It's really, really supportive. So back to the question, because I've kind of digressed a little bit. It's okay to set a boundary. You know, you're struggling. This is not an easy process. It's okay to say to, to, to your extended family, this is what I need. This is what I'm willing to listen to. And I'm not willing to listen to the criticism. And I can't talk to you if you're going to you're going to bring that into the conversation over and over. And for those of you who are extended family members, the, the, the supportive response will, will most likely sound something like, I know you're hurting. I know you're challenged. What can I do to support you? What do you need from us? Do you want us to take the other kids? Do you need a vacation in some way? Do you need, you know, be careful about asking for lots of updates too. Right? Because that's your, if you're the extended family or friends, that's your need. It's hard to be in a moment of challenge, of crisis, and have other people come in the family with their needs, and they don't even know that they're asking for these. I said to my mom during one period in my life when I was struggling, as an adult, well into my adulthood, I said, this is what I need. And at first she said, well, this is what I think I'm going to give you my opinion. I said, you can do that if you want, but I'm not going to take the call if you do. I'm struggling enough. Here's what I need. And my mother, um, amazingly, I didn't ask her to. She went to her therapist. And she came back a week or two later and she said, I talked to my therapist and I realized I wasn't really there for you. What do you need from me? Do you want me to take the kids? Do you want to come on out to California on vacation? What do you need? And it felt so wonderful and so different. So it's okay to set a boundary. It's okay to shut them down. It's okay to ask for what you need. And it's okay to not take care of them in this process. How can a parent and child work on their relationship if they aren't together? Students and clients ask this more than, than parents even. But the, the foundation of a healthy relationship is two healthy selves, two healthy individual selves. I remember at one point when my son was, was going away for an educational experience for a long time, something that was positive in his young adulthood. It was very sad, very heartbreaking for me. My therapist, when I was expressing this to her, said, he needs to get away from me as far as he can, in fact, she said. And I remember thinking, yeah, I, I can do that. Knowing that that's valuable, knowing that, that he needs to find himself and knowing that I'm supporting that and doing that for him and, and that I love him and I can do that for him. So separation is the beginning of connection. Separation is working on each person working on themselves, getting clear. Letter writing therapy is practice at, at what goes on when we're together. You know, the interactions that we have with each other in person, they move so fast. They're so complicated. So wilderness therapy slows it down, helps each, each party work on themselves. And, and with that, more developed sense of self, more developed clarity about what one, what one thinks and feels, what one's boundaries are, the better the connection is, the possibility of connection that exists after that. How do you determine if a child needs aftercare? Um, you know, our, our recommendations for, for after evoke treatment are based on experience. You know, my theoretical orientation taught me as a family therapist that children need to come home and they need to work on it. 
my experience has taught me over two decades that when children and families get to this point, that they may be best served by more treatment and, and more distance. So we have a bias toward that that comes from not our theory, but our experience. We were the first wilderness program in the late 1990s to kind of come in here with that, that idea. We'd worked at other wilderness programs and we thought, this is what we're seeing. So we're going to be biased towards that. We're not going to get into a power struggle. We're not going to try to scare you or control you into it, but we're going to be clear about our recommendations that come from experience. And then you get to decide. And we're going to talk about what works. There's a, there's a broadcast, a podcast webinar on how to choose the best fit aftercare where you, that you can look at if you want to learn more. But we're going to um, help you understand the pros and cons, the needs, and the priority of those, of what we think will work for the child. See, I've had the experience of having hundreds and hundreds of clients come through my own personal group, let alone the thousands of, that have come through my program over the past two decades plus. And I've seen kids go home. I've seen kids go to traditional schools. I've seen kids go to residential treatment programs, boarding schools, sober living environments. And I'll tell it to you this simply. The children that go home are not necessarily happier. In fact, I would share with you that in many cases, it's, it's more difficult, more of a challenge. I've had students and clients write to me, say to me, don't let children go home. Like encourage families to continue this process. So the therapist will recommend you get to decide. It comes from a bias of experience. And although on, on its surface, most children would choose to go home, in reality, they're oftentimes happier in these secondary placements. How do you determine the length of stay? That's even more of an interactive process. It's not a straightforward recommendation, and it's not a simple equation. It's not like if you do better, you leave at a certain date or go home, go to the next program or go home earlier, or if you're struggling, you take longer. It's a complex matrix that you have as a discussion with your therapist, it, it, it depends upon the family history, the family work, the diagnosis, the progress, the goals, the objectives. Some students and clients make more progress. The next setting, you know, if it's home, a longer length, length of stay often would be indicated. Sometimes age makes a difference. Young adults have some say in it, and so they tend to have a shorter length of stay. We want to still reserve some of their buy-in. So it's a real complex matrix. It's a dialogue. And again, it's your decision, you know, our recommendation. My, I can't even answer that question with my own students. You know, when a parent says to me, when should my child leave? Let's say we're in week two or three. My response is, let's talk about that. Let's talk about what we're trying to accomplish. Talk about what we think is possible. Sometimes more treatment progress is possible. Sometimes we need more time for assessment. Sometimes we, we need time for stabilization. Sometimes we need more time for family work. Sometimes the child is wilderness therapy, there, there's a point of diminishing return. And we want to move them on. Sometimes they're going to turn 18 shortly after the, we, they leave the program. So we want to get them, get it to them earlier so that they have time to connect with people before they turn 18 and have that, that, that choice. All right, I'm happy to look at questions that have come in line. First question, how important is it for younger siblings to talk about what's happening to their older sister? My, my son, 16, refuses to discuss and we don't know how to push or if we should. That's similar to the question. Like I said, I'd seen that one come in. That's similar to the question. Understand that sometimes the boundary of not talking is them trying to reserve their own space because it's been so compromised by the family's challenges. If you're asking me, is it ideal for them to talk? In a vacuum, that would be my answer. And it's also important to understand how this, this defense, this boundary, is serving the child. You know, for me, it's about developing 
ears and eyes to hear and see children, even when they're acting out. And I wouldn't say that this, this is acting out. I would validate them. I would say, you know, I was thinking maybe you don't want to talk because it feels scary. Maybe you don't want to talk because it's, you know, you're so tired of talking about your brother or your sister. Maybe you felt so traumatized, re, you know, discussing this is re-traumatizing you. Or this is the one place that you can hold a boundary because your brother or your sister had violated so many of your boundaries. So spend a good amount of time listening, understanding, validating, not pushing, and then make invitations. You know, if you establish that, that, that foundation, then the, the chances for kind of an evolution in the process are, are much more likely. But I'd spend more time on that. Question number two, how as a parent do you not look for trends in your other children and worry about how they will also be addicts? Well, you just do. You know, that's one of the, the, the costs, right, of this job for me. You know, it, it was especially true with my older children. I imagined myself writing hopes and intentions letter for my children for 14 years before I ended up actually having to write one. Um, but, but, but the way you do it, you know, my work, my teaching is this, and you've heard me say this, if you've attended any of these, if you're new to this, then this will be new to you. Do your work. I go to therapy. I've gone to therapy for 30 years. Some people think that's common for therapists. It's not. Some do for sure, but more don't for sure. I've been with my current therapist for 19 years. And I do that to get clear, to find myself, to sort things out so that when I, I come back to my children, I can more accurately see them. If the trauma of having a child who's developing addiction isn't processed, isn't healed, isn't worked through, then I'm much, much more likely to respond from a, a trauma place. Right? I'm going to run it through that filter. So the answer to the question is, those of us who have children that struggle, I believe everybody could benefit from therapy, but those of us that have children that st struggle need therapy more. We need more support. We need more resources. We need to process it so that when we come to the child, when we meet the child, we're not responding from that filter, because that's been worked out, but we're responding from a place of clarity and we can more accurately see the child. My book basically says this in, in a way. The question is not, what do you do, I say. The question is, who are you? And when you answer the question, who are you? You can then begin to answer the question is, who's the other person? Who's my child? And then you can answer the question of, what's my relationship to their issues? How do I involve myself in their issues? So finding self understanding self, resolving your own trauma is, is the key to clarity and healthy attachment. A great book and resource for this, besides my book, is, is Parenting from the Inside Out by Hartzell and Siegel. Parenting from the Inside Out by Hartzell and Siegel. I also did three broadcasts on those, so you can listen to the webinars, watch the webinars, or listen to the podcasts on those. Question number three, tips for reentry. When the addict comes home, should their room be different? And how do we improve communication and support? It's a common intervention to change the room. I'm in favor of that, to clean things up. Um, in terms of communication and support, following our curriculum, listening to our podcasts, doing the assignments that we ask you to do, going to Al-Anon meetings, at least six of them, You'll, you'll, hit, you'll hit the ground running. Do the work. Uh, look at what you need to look at your relapse. Make yourself the project. When you do that, it takes pressure off the child. So just, I mean, it, it, it's in all that we ask and invite you to do through the parent pool. 12 step groups, letters, the webinars, the podcasts the books, the therapy at home, you know, in Al-Anon, what they say is 
stay on your side of the street, like work on your side of the street, clean up your side of the street. That's what you can do to meet them where they're at. They've been immersed in therapy, tools and skills, but you're still going to have to show up as the adult. It's interesting. Our, our, our research shows us that parents that are motivated and active are, are in many ways the most powerful predictor of long-term success. And that, that goes for children that, that have graduated, gone through the process at a, a lot of different levels of success and motivation. Uh, next question. My niece is in the program. I have three young kids, ages 9 to 11. How should I, if at all, reference what my niece is going through with, to my kid? Or should I not mention it, given all the young ages? Okay. You know, I'm a, I'm a fan of therapy, like I said. I believe in it. I don't, I've spent my life trying to destigmatize it. I never really had a stigma associated with it because I grew up in Southern California, and if you weren't going to therapy, you kind of weren't cool. Um, so I, I talk about it a lot. My children have heard about it. They know that I go. They know that their mother goes. At one point, my younger children said, why can't we go? All of my children have gone to therapy. Um, when my children were very young, I used to say to them before they were younger than this, even younger than nine to 11, I would just simply say, I go to work with the sad boys because I work with boys primarily. I would say I, I work with the sad boys in the wilderness in the mountains to help them. And it's an oversimplified term, of course, but to help them kind of figure out how to be happy. I just posted something on Twitter the other day that reminded me of this lesson as it landed with my oldest, my, my son, who's now 25, when he was four or five, we were watching Disney's Peter Pan. And during a scene where Captain Hook was terrorizing Peter Pan or the Lost Boys, my four or five year old son turned to me and said, hey dad, Captain Hook isn't bad, is he? He's just sad. It was one of my happiest moments as a parent. Because that's really what we're working with. We're working with, with people that are hurting. So I like the idea of talking about it. I would, of course, talk to your, your niece's parents and, and see if they have any parameters and, and, and maybe even talk to the niece about it. You know, they can have some stay because in part it's their program. But my, my, my greatest hope, my greatest aspiration is that we could all talk about the therapy that we need and that we could all benefit from. Even people who haven't struggled in their life with significant mental health or functioning issues, they could use some therapy. I know a lot of people who have never seen the need for it. I thought, gosh, it would be really nice if you knew yourself a little bit more and were more aware about what you were saying and doing to other people. You're not abusive or cruel, but boy, it would be really nice to, 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 for you to get some therapy and some awareness. So that's my bias. All right, then I'm going to go through some upcoming and then I'll go back and see if there are any questions. These are the, the six support groups. If you want to support your family member in therapy, walk into one of these meetings. Search on the internet, Al-Anon, Coda, or Families Anonymous, and walk into a meeting. If nothing else, it will give you compassion, empathy, and respect for what your, your family member has been asked to do. If nothing else, it will do that, let alone the fact that in these meetings, whether you have an addicted niece, nephew, grandchild, friend, daughter, son, cousin, sibling, it will, it tells you how to be in relationship to other people in a, in a healthy way, particularly those that are struggling. You can also go to NAMI.org to get classes, more information, free resources. All of our broadcasts, if you're a family, family member, these are for these, these live webinars, for the most part, are for current families. But the podcasts that we make out of these are available to anybody. So just scroll through the topics and see what jumps out to you. Give a listen. If you have an iPhone or an iOS device, go to the podcast app and search Evoke Therapy Program. On an Android device, download the SoundCloud app and search Evoke Therapy Program. On a computer, go to soundcloud.com and search Evoke Therapy Program. You can find us on Twitter and Instagram, inspirational quotes, stories, pictures. 
sometimes from alumni. You, you can find us at Evoke Therapy on Facebook. You can search Evoke Therapy Program. You can also go to the Evoke Family Foundation on Facebook if you want to become involved in or learn about a program set up by alumni families to, to raise money to help people who can't afford therapy. Of course, our blog is a great resource. My book, The Journey of the Royal Parent, is available on Amazon. There's a problem with the warehouse stock. So right now, if you want to buy a copy, just go here to the, the underneath the paperback square on Amazon and click on the nine million. You can you can buy it directly from Revoke Therapy Programs. You can also buy an audio version or a CD version or, or a Kindle version. We want all current families to go to a workshop. This is a two day experiential kind of field visit, education, networking, uh, connecting with others. The next one is September. Uh, actually, those dates are off. So if you want to know, know more, more information, contact Melanie at evoketherapy.com. If you want to do a deep dive, you don't have to be an evoke parent. About half of the attendees are evoke parents, half are not. If you want to do some amazing work, we have a cabin in Park City, a lodge in Park City, where we do four and a half day intensive. We call them Finding You. I, I've done one. Everybody in my family has done one. I go and do a version of it every year for myself. It's amazing. It's a therapy accelerator, a therapy springboard. Finding You, the next one is November 7th through 11th. If you've been to a Finding You, you can come to Finding You too, November 25th to 29th. If your child is an alumni of our Wilderness Therapy Program, they can also qualify if they're 18 years of old, years of age or older, they can go to an alumni intensive. To learn more, go to our website or email intensives at evoketherapy.com. I'm going to be in Birmingham, Alabama tomorrow night, speaking to a group. And then here are parent support groups that you're all welcome to, to attend in Chicago, New York, and Philadelphia. Contact Melanie at evoketherapy.com. The questions to RSVP or for more information. Pursuit trips are our adventure trips for families and young adults. Any other live questions come come in? How old is the sister? I have a sister asking the question, what's the best way to help? How old are you? 25. Okay. Um, great question. The best way to help is to learn what they're learning, to be vulnerable. I had a sibling years ago who didn't struggle like their sibling that came through a book, and they were going out to visit them at their therapeutic program after a book for the first time. And they called and they said, I don't want to mess up. I want to be supportive. I'm afraid I'm going to say the wrong thing. And I said, why don't you just show up and say that? Just say you're afraid of messing up and you don't know what to say and you're anxious and you want to support. And what would be so cool about that is that your sibling would for the first time maybe in that relationship not be the screw up. You know, they would be the one that's, that's, that knows more than you, if that's the case in your family too. But just showing up vulnerably. What I ask siblings to do, especially in their mid-20s, because you know, you're an adult, is just do some of their work. Just see what it feels like. Listen to a podcast. You're listening to one now, of course. Read a book. Walk into an Al-Anon or a Families Anonymous meeting. And, and share with your sibling your respect and empathy and admiration for the courage. Talk about your, your, your own self. You might not have the same kind of struggles and challenges and problems that they have. You don't need to. The best way that any of you family members can be supportive is to show up with your own vulnerability and, and to support them with that and ask them questions. And if you learn something, share that with them. If there's something you need to work on, share that with them. And if you're anxious and worried and don't know what to say, share that with them. And if you have a little bit of education, even better. Even better to share with them your own work. What I do with my clients, with my 14, 15, 16, 17 year old boys, is I just share with them my struggles. Often. I'm talking about something and I say, I go to therapy. I have insecurities. I've covered up my stuff 
with defenses not unlike yours. And yes, I may be farther along the path than you, but I can relate to you. And the more educated, the more experience you have, the more articulate you can be in that. So thank you for that question. That's fantastic. Remember, vulnerability, they don't need lectures, advice, anecdotes, moral stories. They want to feel safe. Just think about this. Think about this, all of you. The amygdala, the part of the brain that, that is the fight or flight part of the brain, the, the lower part of the brain, the limbic system, right? That's the part of the brain that perceives threat and creates the fight or flight response. And if the amygdala is on fire, if the amygdala is lit up, if the amygdala is functioning, meaning the child is feeling afraid, threatened, it hijacks the rest of the brain. They don't think rationally or logically. They respond in reactive, irrational ways, right? That's the way that it works. That's the way human beings are wired, literally. So we first have to quiet the amygdala. And that means we have to make them feel safe. And the best way to make people feel safe is to listen, connect, and understand no matter how crazy it is, and to be vulnerable and real yourself. Then the top part of the brain, the higher functioning, the higher thinking, the higher reasoning part of the brains open up and all the lessons, all the seeds that you want to plant, all the wisdom you want to share has a place to land. All right. Looks like that's all the questions for this evening. Thank you for joining us. I hope this was a helpful point of contact. Please feel free to peruse our, our podcast library. If your evoke therapist thinks it's appropriate, share with your sister, brother, niece, nephew, grandchild, cousin, share with them that you listened and maybe learned something and share with them that you're checking into what they're doing. And if you have the courage and the time to walk into a meeting, share with them how much you respect what they're doing being here and sharing in this group. I'm going to be traveling a bit with, with some speaking and visits. So the next broadcast will be Thursday, November 1st at 7.30. Well, that's actually next week. It'll be next next week at 7.30. I had to change it because of some things. So 7.30 Mountain Time, a half an hour later than we usually start. I apologize for you East Coasters about that, but I had to do that for some other scheduling conflict. Thank you for on behalf of your loved one who's out of Vogue. I hope you have a, a good weekend. Take care of yourselves and goodbye.